Last week, I don't know if this is what John was trying to say, but I'll tell you what I walked away with. <laughs> it's funny how God just sort of speaks, and, uh, and sometimes you go up to the pastor and you go, wow, that was a great sermon on this, and the pastor goes, I, I, I wasn't trying to say that. But um, He reminded us that um, even if we follow the Lord, that that, that will be trouble, um, that loving Jesus doesn't make life trouble-free, um, but that life does matter. Um, and that was, that was different than the thoughts that was going around in the early um, Roman world. And I think it's often different in ours. There were people who were living for passion and for fun, the Epicureans and the Stoics who said, we've got to be really disciplined and, uh, and keep everything under wraps and tight in order to make the best life possible. But really, none of it matters at the end of the day. Um, and uh, I was thinking about that. I was, I, I was uh, considering his sermon and... Um, I don't know. Fall gets dark and dreary, and um, in the midst of trying to say, "Man, it's Thanksgiving. We have so much to be thankful for." Uh, I don't know about you, but sometimes I look around and I'm like, "Oh, I don't feel like singing thoughts of grateful praise right now." Um, I remember my dad had a place in Mexico, and we'd go there, and um, the tide would go out like three quarters of a mile. It's an amazing, amazing place, um, right on the Sea of Cortez there, and. And there was great shells to be had. And the best shells were as far out as you could get because nobody had got out there. But in order to get to them, you'd walk over these sand dunes. And sometimes uh, there wouldn't be sand there, and it would turn into mud. And so you'd be stepping in the mud, and it'd be up to your toes. The next thing you know, it's up to your ankles. And pretty soon, it's, it's up to your knees. And if you've ever walked through mud up to your knees, it's like... <laughs> and um, I think life... Sometimes it feels like that. Sometimes we're cruising over the sand dunes and we're picking up beautiful shells and this is amazing. And other times we're slogging through the mud. Um, and it's into that midst of uh, slogging into the mud that I want to have um, an encounter with God that actually kind of lifts with my spirits. Um, that makes me not just a slave to what the circumstances are. And so... That's what I found this week as I was digging through the section of Acts that we're going to look at. And it's Acts 16, um, 22 through 34. And I'll read it for us. So. It says that the crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten. And after they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commended to guard them carefully. And upon receiving such orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. And about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And at once all the prison doors flew open, and everybody's chains came loose. And the jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, because he thought, the prisoners have escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself, we're all here. And the jailer called for the lights, rushed in, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they replied, believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. And at that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. And then immediately he and all his family were baptized. And the jailer brought them into his house, set a meal before them. And he was filled with joy because he'd come to believe in God, him and his whole family. And when it was daylight, the magistrates sent for the officers to the jail in order to release those men. So let's pray. God, um, speak to us about our lives. Um, speak to us about this journey in which we can celebrate and be thankful in the moments, um, but other moments that we trudge through the mud and, and show us what being with you in the midst of that um, makes a difference. We love you. Amen. Um, have you known people who sort of rise about their circumstances? Um, like, you look around, and so often I feel like our attitudes are sort of based on our circumstances. We go, wow, the Hawks lost this week, and uh, everyone's kind of down. And then the Hawks win a big game, and, and you can feel it in the city. Everybody's like, woo, we're the best. Um, 
Um, and there's this like sense of, oh, circumstances are great, so yeah, I'm happy. Or circumstances are not so great right now, so uh, I'm pretty, pretty down. Um, I was talking with a friend of mine this week, um, and she uh, came out for a job interview, and it was, it was kind of the perfect job for her. It's, it's an amazing opportunity, and, and as she, it was a, a nonprofit, and she was looking at the nonprofit and was thrilled with the work they were doing, and thrilled with what her role would be, and it was just a perfect fit. And then she walked into the interview, and um, it said, you know, we're not too concerned about really your, your gifts or your abilities, but what we really want to know is, um, do you believe the Bible to be inerrant? And um, uh, how do you feel about gay marriage? And it, it, it became this um, theological inquiry, and um, she was kind of caught off guard by it, but shared where she was. And then they said, you know, we, we would love to hire you, but um, it's pretty clear that, that you've got this wrong, and we're not even sure you're a Christian, so I don't think you'd be a good fit. Um, this is a Presbyterian pastor friend of mine, by the way. She was just sideswiped. And I don't know if you've ever felt, um, I'm sure you probably have disappointment, rejection, or just life sideswipes you with something. I didn't ask for this. Where did this come from? Um, and, and sometimes uh, we end up in these situations where we don't even know where this came from. It's from outside ourselves. For Paul and Silas, they were sharing the good news of God. They have come to this place. They're uh, there. And then um, as they're sharing the good news with people around, uh, this woman begins to follow them. And, and she begins yelling, These are the servants of the Most High God, and they're here to show us the way of salvation. Not a bad message, right? I mean, it's true. Um, but it totally killed Paul's style. Paul engages with people, and he says, well, what do you believe? And here's what, here's what I believe. And then he kind of dialogues about this. And can you imagine having somebody behind you going, he's going to try and convert you. <laughs> <laughs> and so Paul's like, ah. And eventually he, through his discernment, uh, recognizes that this woman is possessed and turns around and says, demon, come out of her. Woman set free from the demon. She's no longer yelling about his role, and uh, things go on. But the owners of this uh, woman slave go, oh, by driving out that demon, they took away her gifts that we've used to make money, and now our steady flow of income is gone. And so they rile everybody up, and the next thing you know, Paul and Silas are being arrested and beaten and thrown in prison. Sideswiped into a prison, and... Um, I think sometimes life sideswipes us into a prison as well. We want to live fully, we want to live richly, but this this thing has come up, and sometimes it's a boss, not you, John. Um, <laughs> sometimes it's an illness, sometimes it's a relationship, sometimes it's uh, just something comes up in it, and it makes life hard, and it makes us feel like we are trudging through the mire and the muck. Um, I love Psalm 40, and in Psalm 40, it it says, you know, you've, you've come along and you lifted me out of the mire and the muck and you set my feet upon a solid ground. And um, that's what we long for, but life feels like muck sometimes. The jailer has his own little prison. Um, it's He's in control of it, uh, but it's one that he made. And um, he's chosen this life of being a jailer in the Roman Empire. And it's not a good life. I mean, imagine this. You go to work and you spend your day trying to go to sleep while listening to the cries of agony from a bunch of prisoners. Maybe you got into this field because you have a strong sense of justice, but the Roman Empire basically, with anybody that they don't like, like Paul in this situation, uh, they give him to you and, and you're there to make sure that he doesn't get away. Um, you're actually aiding in justice instead of providing justice. And, um, and he had heard about Paul. He said, you know, this guy was, was out there saying that he believed that he knew God and that God uh, had come to save, and then he was trying to spread that, and now we need him locked up in here to watch him. So that's his life. And if he fails at his job, he doesn't get a demotion, he gets killed. So, uh, yeah, 
it's not a great, great spot. And um, I think sometimes our prisons um, are of our own making. As I have gotten older um, and a little bit more reflective, I have to admit that I have made choices in my life that have taken me into spots that I don't feel like I'm living fully. Um, lately, my wine has been, why have all my long-term friendships sort of withered and died? And then it occurred to me that I haven't invested in those long-term friendships, so why wouldn't they wither and die? It's a, it's a consequence of my own sin. Um, and I think uh, God comes into the midst of these prisons, the ones that um, come from outside, sideswipe us and, and hem us in and don't let us live a full life and comes to the ones that we make ourselves. And he says, I want you to be able to live. I want you to be able to walk on solid ground. I want to make your way firm. I have come that you might have life, life to the full, John 10.10. 10. Um, and I think all of us get this sense I think it even comes up in this politics time. We look around at all the stuff going on in politics and we're like, is this the best we can come up with? Are these two candidates? But I think underneath that statement is another sense that, is this the best that we can do in our world? Is this the best that we can do in our lives? Is this the best that we can do? Um, and the good news of God is that he can do more. Um, and so Paul and Silas are sitting in this prison and they are praying, which is a really good start when we're in the mock, by the way. Really good start. They go, we, we need to bring this to God. And so they, uh, it literally says um, in verse 25, they were praying and singing hymns to God. And I always thought they were just having a little worship service. They were like, I don't know, do you want to do the opening? Should we do announcements? Uh, okay, we'll just do this because we're stuck here. Um, and that's really not what was going on. It um, literally says, as they were praying, it led into singing hymns. I don't know if you've ever experienced that, but they were they were praying, and they're going, you know, Lord, this is a lot to bear. We came out here for your goodness. We're trying to do the right thing, and this thing goes sideways, and now we just are trapped in this prison and not able to do what we wanted to do for you, and we just feel so weak. We feel powerless. And I can kind of picture Paul going, you are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. And Silas begins to sing with him, and the other prisoners are going, those dudes are weird. <laughs> and, um, and then Silas goes, you know, that's a good song. How about we sing this one? And they're passing the time praying and singing. And everyone um, is listening to them. And as they do this, um, hymns of praise begin to come forth. It's a strange thing how meeting with God in the midst of the muck, we pray for changes of our circumstances. And what we find is God not necessarily changing our circumstances, but the spirit lightning, our ability to see the things that are right and good and worth giving praise for, even in the midst what we don't want. Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Um, I know that uh, for me, one of the, the most uh, blunt examples of this, I was working at McDonald's a lot through college and just prior to when I came to faith. And Rushes were a horrible time at, at McDonald's. There's grease flying everywhere. There's burgers flying everywhere. Everyone's trying to do everything as quickly as possible. And nobody, nobody is happy. Not be in the crew at a McDonald's during a rush. And um, and I was like, man, this is horrible, so I'm just going to try to focus on God as best as I can, and thankfully when you're a cook at McDonald's, there's a large uh, space for you to kind of do what you want. And so I found myself going, well, I'm going to try and focus on God. And at the time I knew one Christian song, and it was the doxology. <laughs> we sang that every week when they did the offering. And so it was a praise God from whom all blessings flow. And so I'd start singing this while I'm flipping burgers. And um, and the people around me are like, he's nuts. Actually, there, there was a debate going on about me. Either he's on drugs or this God thing is so cool that he can actually be happy in the midst of a rush. 
and we don't know quite what to do with it. And uh, it ended up leading to some people coming to faith. Um, Sometimes it was just a Bible verse that I carried around and I tried to memorize that day. But, but it, there was this turning to God in the midst and it changes the circumstances enough that you can see God is there with you in it. I was still in the rush. I was still open burgers. But there was a joy. And that's what we see happening with Paul and Silas. Um, I love the confession that uh, Richard used today. Um, Psalm 51 um, actually, let me read part of it for you. I don't know if you caught it in there. We've heard this passage a few times. It says, Don't cast me away from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. It says, Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Not joy in circumstances, but joy of your salvation. And grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Grant me the strength to and the spirit to make it through this, to sustain us through it. Um, that's how God meets us in the midst. Um, and this, um, this had a huge impact on the people around them. We sometimes think that spending time with God is just for our sakes, but it actually impacts everybody around us. Um, the, it says that the the other people in the jail, they were they were listening to them. And, and that's not just, well, we're stuck here, so we have to deal with the singing guys. It was, they were attentively going, what on earth are they doing? And I think they were having that effect of, man, this is a horrible place. My worst day ever. I'm in prison. Who knows what's about to happen to me? I'm probably beaten up right now. And over there, there's some guys singing songs of grateful praise. How on earth does that happen? And I don't know if you experience that when you go to your work, but there's plenty of people around who will complain and be disappointed in life. And then there's these people that go, yeah, circumstances are rough. God's good, isn't he? And it's weird, and it's beautiful, and it's attractive to people. Um, and this, this jailer... Um, then there's the moment. It's, it's the crucial moment in the story. It's the moment where God breaks in and, and there's an earthquake. And I think that actually happens in our lives too. There's this earthquake, not like the ground shaking, but like something shifts in us and we go, oh, my problems aren't the end of the world. My circumstances don't need to rule over me and I'm alive because of God. Um, there's this moment of this earthquake and um, by the way, historically, the, the caves, um, this was how you would build a jail. There's caves in the rocks. It's pretty hard to build walls that prisoners won't get through. So take a cave, slap a big gate over it, and you've got yourself a prison cell. Find enough little caves in an area, slap a gate over all of them, and you've got a good prison. And then stick a guy out in front and say, make sure nobody comes out of the caves. Um, that was kind of how it worked. So an earthquake happens, the rocks shift a little bit, and all the gates fall down because they're no longer in a good spot. Um, and so literally, these people are set free, and um, God wants to break our prisons. He wants to shift the ground of our lives enough that things begin to settle differently, and suddenly gates that have been around our lives and have us in are no longer there. And this happens... And for Paul and the prisoners, this is an amazing miracle. God showed up as we were praying, and boom, we're free. For the jailer, this is his worst nightmare. If I don't keep these people in their cells, I die. Um, and the stoicism of the day um, had expanded suicide rates dramatically, by the way. The idea that, you know what, you're just supposed to keep everything under control... Your life doesn't actually matter, and it's not enjoyable. And so people go, well, what's the point? This is not fun. I'm out. And, um, and this jailer is sitting there going, everything has gone sideways in my life. And the Romans are about to kill me for it. So what's the point? And he pulls his sword. And then um, Paul speaks up, and I believe it's the voice of God speaking up through him. And it's the voice of God that we need to hear that says, don't do it. I have 
some good news. We're all here. You can live. There's a better life ahead of you that you can't even see right now. So don't do it. God has a way of breaking into our life and saying, yeah, your circumstances might change, might not change. Um, this difficulty in your life might not go away. It might get worse before it gets better, but it doesn't get the last word. That's the beauty of the gospel. Who gets the last word? God. God gets the last word in our lives. Because of Jesus Christ, because of his willingness to lay down his life, God gets the last word, and those things that are not set right in our world will be set right in heaven. And those things that are wrong in our life may or may not change during our life, but they'll be set right. And we have a hope and a future because of it. We can live um, abundant, eternal life with God is where we're headed, whether we know it or not. And some of it's going to break through in our lives, and some of it. We'll have to wait, but ultimately, we will win. And that's when it hits this jailer, that not only did he need to not stab himself with his sword, but that he needed saving. Something occurred, and I believe that he finally put all the pieces together, and he goes, wait, these guys were put in jail because they were running around saying that they knew God, and that he had a plan for people's lives, and it was to give life and salvation to them. That's crazy. Maybe not worth getting locked up for, but that's a crazy idea. And then these guys are sitting here talking to this God that they think they know in a very intimate way, which is weird, too. I remember praying with my brother at dinner once, and he goes, you talk to him like you know him. That's weird. You know, talk to him daily. Um, and then an earthquake happens that sets everybody free, and then miracle of miracles, none of them leave. And they decide to stick around and tell me about Jesus. And then he goes, I got a question. What do I got to do to be saved? How do I get to be a part of this? Um, I used to think it's a conversion question. It's like the ultimate, hey, you're not a Christian, you could be. Next. It's not just that. I think it's the question that should dominate our lives every single day of our lives. God, what must I do to be saved? How do I get saved from this work? How do I get saved from my own dysfunction? How do we get saved from a world that's gone sideways? All this muck and mire begs the question, God, how can you save? How can I be saved in the midst of this? And Paul's answer is beautiful. He doesn't say, well, you need to sign up for a six-month class of theology, and then I'll be able to break it all down for you. He doesn't draw him a picture of like a chasm and a cross and people walking over a cross, even though that was really cool in my life. He goes, well, here's what it is. Um, believe in the Lord Jesus you'll be saved. Um, and believe wasn't like, uh, I think it got screwed up by modernity. We got into the sciences and we were like, oh, we go to school, we learn all these facts, and, and you eventually believe that two plus two is four, and then you go on with your life and it really doesn't impact anything. Um, and we, we got into a place in the church where we began to do that. And I believe that our churches, including times in my own life, are full of moments when I say, yeah, I believe in Jesus. But it really doesn't change anything. Um, what they're talking about when they say believe in the New Testament is this idea of trust. It is to put your weight down on something. It is to put your life in that thing's hands. And so when they say Believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved. What they're saying is give your life to Jesus. Let Jesus into that situation and see what he can do. Because he can save. Um, how can I be saved? It's not an intellectual ascent. And it's an incredibly humbling thing. It is totally contrary to the way the world works. Everything in us begs to have control and to be self-managing. I don't, I don't really need your help, but thanks. Um, you know, uh, I've got this until I don't. And then there's these moments where you get a call and you go, oh, I don't know what.
what to do with this. And then we finally have this moment where we go, I guess I have to pray. Um, preaching is a really good thing for me because I think it brings me to a point just about every time where I go, Lord, I, I don't know how to do this. Help. Because without you, this isn't going to happen. Um, but that's a hard moment, too. Um, humbling ourselves to the point where we say we need God. This world needs God. And we count on God for it. Trust and lean on Jesus. That's, that's how we're saved. And then grace breaks through. And amazing, non-worldly things begin to happen. For Paul and Silas, um, they have just been praying about being set free to go preach the gospel. And an earthquake happens and the jail comes down. And they recognize that their calling isn't calling them to just run away and go do their thing. Their calling is to share the gospel with this jailer who's about to kill himself. A bunch of prisoners who are not necessarily followers of the Lord have also been set free. And this is the part of the text that has bugged me for years. Why did they all leave? Like, I can see the jailer being like, I'm going to kill myself. I can see Paul and Silas looking at him going, we've got to save this guy's life. I would love to run away, but we can't. But the other guys, we're all here. And here's what I think happened. They're sitting there in prison. They have had a rough life, made some poor choices along the way, and are now in jail. And suddenly, some guys are put in jail for having known God and for having a known way to be saved. They're singing and they're praying, which is weird to do in a prison anyway. And the joy of the Lord seems to be welling up in them. And then an earthquake happens. Wow, couldn't get more God than that. An earthquake happens, and all the jail doors come down, and these guys had a decision. They could go, we can keep on doing life the way we've been doing it, and it'll probably lead to the same road. We can make a run from the Roman government right now. <laughs> that might give us a couple weeks. Or, these guys have something. And this something is able to shake jails open and provide a different way of life that is actually life. I could run, but i got to hear what they have to say. So they make a choice. And it's a choice we all make. Run, go do life our way. Or bring our life to the Lord with all of its muck and mire and say, what do you got to say with this guy? What can you do? I'm going to give you a shot at this. <laughs> And then grace shows up. They find a way to life that doesn't matter if they're in prison or not. A way that lifts them above their circumstances. It gets them out of the muck and mire and puts their feet on solid rock. Um, and that can happen whatever circumstances you're in, whatever the jails might be. Um, freedom happens inside. And grace emerges. Funny thing is, um, there's a response that comes to grace too, and that's one of the questions: is what do we do with this grace? And um, Paul and Silas, what they did with grace was they were set free, and they stuck around and they laid down their lives. You realize they're going back to jail at the end of this night where they've hung out with this jailer and shared the good news with him and his family. They've made a decision. All right, yeah, you can lock us back up again, but we got to tell you the good news first. They made a choice. They said, this guy needs our help. We're going to help. We're going to care for him. Um, and the jailer gets to make his response to this exciting news that there's a God who loves him and cares for him. And so he goes, well, um, shoot, I would love to hear more. I want you to talk to my household. So how about you come home with me tonight? I know that you're officially under lock and key, but the jail's all broken. So uh, let me get these other guys secure and then I'll just take you home. Now imagine that, him coming home at night. Uh, wife, we're going to have some guests tonight. I brought prisoners home. Um, they were locked up in my jail, and then there was this earthquake. But they know God, and they have a way that we can be saved, so we got to have them over for dinner. Do you mind cooking up some extra food? Oh, and by the way, we're also going to take care of all their wounds before we uh, put them back in jail tomorrow. Is that cool? She says, I hate it when you bring your work home with me. <laughs> 
bring your work home and bad things happen, but there's this bizarre moment where he goes, you know what, I don't know what to do about this, but come on over, have dinner. You got a wound, let me help dress it, and uh, I got to take you back in the morning or else they'll kill me, but let me do that. Um, grace is a funny thing. When grace um, comes into our life, when, when God shows up and, and blesses us in some way, and then it stops there and we go, that was nice. It doesn't work. Um, it, it gets stagnant. Uh, it's a little bit like breathing. You ever try and like breathe but not breathe out? <sighs> yeah, it's not working for me. Um, we breathe in God, but if we don't breathe it out, it gets old. I've had times in my faith where it felt really stale, and other times where it's just coming in. Um, during camp, during Bible school, my days were filled with studying the Bible, and my nights were filled with Bible study with friends, and um, and then I was helping plan worship every day, and I got to do worship every day, and there was this massive inflow of God into my life, and um, every summer had to be spent at camp sharing the gospel with little kids because. It gets old if it just stays inside. Um, it has to go out of us. Some of you have gotten to use my Uber experience. I get to drive a few of you to the airport. Um, and I tell you, I'm, I'm delighted to do this, and nobody believes me. They're like, who wants to drive anybody to the airport at 2 a.m.? Um, I do. Here's the reason why. It's a place where some of the stuff that God's put in some of the blessings that I've been given can flow back out. Um, you've been given an, an interesting life, a unique life. You've trudged through muck and mire that I have never had to trudge through. And um, God has shown up and blessed you in ways that I don't even begin to know. And when you use those and they flow back out, it becomes alive for all of us. That's the gift. And this jailer, what does he have? food, some bandages, no knowledge of Jesus Christ whatsoever, but it says he was filled with joy. His worst day turned into his best day, because he met the Lord, and he paid it forward a little bit. Grace doesn't stop with us, and um, I think it's really fitting that we're having communion right now, because um, and I don't want to be really weird or crude about this, but we're going to take in Jesus. There's a funky symbol that Jesus said, you know what? We're going to take in this as his body and blood, and it's going to actually get inside you, and it's going to do something. It's going to actually give you nutrients and life. But it's also going to come out of you at some point. And I think that Jesus chose food and drink on purpose, because God wants to flow into our lives Take us out of the muck and mire, set our feet on solid ground, and then for that to actually be spread forward. For us to be people not ruled by our circumstances, but ruled by the grace of God and His power. And then as that moves through our life in the organic ways that it does to the people around us, the kingdom of God spreads, and it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Um, so, as we take communion, I want to I want to take a couple. Uh, moments before you come up. I'm going to have the folks who are serving communion come up, and then I'm going to have the worship team come up after them. And during that time, I, I want to invite you to not only remember what Jesus has done for you, but take a moment to just pray and give God your muck and mire, whatever it is right now. Whatever stuff is dragging you down, just, just go, God, this I need to put into your hands. I believe in you. I trust you, and so I'm going to lean into you in this way. Here's my ugh. We all have our ugh. And then come up and know that you're being given life. Let's pray. God, we have our prisons. We make them. We get put in them by other things. Um, we don't live life to the full. And yet you show up. You give us grace. You shift the earth, you break things open, and you set us free. So, Lord, 
Help us to be people who are mindful of your grace in our lives. We thank you for your great love, for your great sacrifice on our behalf. And so, Lord, we give you our lives. We believe in you. We trust you. And as we do so, Lord, lift us up out of the muck and the mire. Set our feet on solid ground and help us to walk in such a way that we spread the kingdom of God and bless the world in ways that only we can. You are good, and we love you.